Hi everyone, I'm Stan Mallon. Welcome to Paranormal Yakko. My guest today is UFO and paranormal researcher and investigator, Preston Dennett. Uh, he's also a best-selling author, and I'll be talking with him about his book, Not From Here, Selected UFO Articles, Volume 5. Preston Dennett, welcome to Paranormal Yakker. Thanks, Stan. Thanks for having me on. It's always a pleasure. As you know, Preston, I've interviewed you a number of times on Paranormal Yakker, and it's always a pleasure for me to yak with you, and I know from the response I receive from my viewers, they always look forward to it when you're my guest, so I thank you. Since one of the books I interviewed you about was volume four in your Not From Here series, it makes sense to interview you about volume five, which, like the previous book, explores the little known and more unusual aspects of the UFO phenomenon. I'll now ask you about some of them. For the most part, when UFO sightings are reported by people, they generally talk about seeing one or two craft. Sometimes, however, they show up in large numbers. And uh, while cases like these are rare, they do have a lot to teach us about the UFO phenomenon. What, Preston? Does that teach us about the UFO phenomenon? Many people who see UFOs, it's one or two crap, even five or 10 or 20 even. But once you go above those numbers, it's very rare. There's not a whole lot of cases. I found about a dozen, not quite, but close, in which people see, you know, 50 craft or 100 even or more. So these, I think, are really important cases. One, because they are so rare. But second, I think they have some important takeaways. One is that it shows that these craft do exist in very large numbers. Here on Earth, all our military has what we would call fleets, bunches of ships, planes, police cars, or what have you. So it should come as no surprise that ETs also have what we would call fleets, large amounts of craft. But I think an even more important takeaway from these kinds of cases is that they show that ETs are putting on what I would call a publicity campaign, announcing their presence. Because while often UFOs are very evasive in a way, I mean, you can't just go outside and see a UFO at any given time, like you can a plane, perhaps, but they clearly want to be seen. Because UFO researchers long ago coined this term, a display, because there are instances where UFOs are very brazen, clearly wanting to be seen. And that's exactly what we see in these kinds of cases. I think the ultimate example is what happened on March 17, 1950 in Farmington, New Mexico. Now, this is just a little town in New Mexico, about 3,000 residents, 6,000 if you include the outlying areas. And on that day, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, suddenly all these crafts showed up. Well over 100, probably closer to two or 300. Hard to estimate for sure. But pretty much everyone in town who was outside saw them. It stopped traffic in the streets. People in schools came running out. Uh, people who were in their homes and places of business all came running outside to watch this. A again, a display that went on for probably an hour or more. They estimate that most of the people in the town saw this. The mayor certainly did. People at the newspaper's office, police officers, pretty much everyone saw this. And what they saw is amazing. It, these were little craft, quite high up, most of them, darting around and not just going across the sky and leaving. They were doing these incredible maneuvers where they come together, come around each other and pull off, come right at each other and pull away, turning at right angles, hovering. There was at least one larger craft which appeared to be releasing smaller craft. And this went on for such a long time that there were photographs taken. And you can clearly see it's a metallic craft in this photograph. And finally, after about an hour, it left. But as if to just make sure 
that everyone did see this. They returned and did a second display for about slightly less time and off they went. And needless to say, this did get all kinds of attention in the press. It got inter or national headlines, certainly. And the Air Force clamped down hard and fast. First, they tried to ignore it. And of course, they got so many inquiries that they couldn't. And then they tried to debunk it. And that they said basically that this was probably a weather balloon, skyhook weather balloon that had shattered. And all what people were seeing were little flakes of the balloon, which is clearly no, nowhere close to explaining the evidence. I mean, if that were true, there would be little pieces of a balloon all over the place. And there was not one single one. The witnesses, of course, disagreed. The Air Force did show up, interviewed a bunch of people, threatened a few, they said, told them not to talk. And it just created a whole furor, sort of an argument between the press and the people in the town and the Air Force itself. Quite a few articles were published on this. It should be a much better known event than it is. That's just one really good example of these kinds of cases. Although UFO encounters may seem random, often they're not. In fact, it's possible to call a UFO down out of the sky. And these close encounters of the fifth kind are changing the face of UFO research. How, Preston, does one go about calling a UFO down out of the sky? And how has this changed UFO research? Yeah, this is a relatively new term, close encounters of the fifth kind, human initiated contact. But it's been going on for a very long time. It's enjoyed a lot of popularity recently because I think it does have great potential because UFO encounters do seem often to be random and unpredictable. But there are quite a few cases where people have called them down using lights, perhaps, meditation, going out and doing a UFO stakeout, so to speak, and calling out mentally to them, which does work. Because you have to remember when people have direct contact with ETs, communication, almost without exception, is done telepathically. There are a few outlying cases, of course, where pe people talk verbally with ETs, but generally speaking, it is telepathic. So the sort of idea behind this is that by sending out a telepathic message, you can reach out to them. Ultimately, that is how it works. Consciousness is key to this. While lights are a part of it, I'm not so sure they're absolutely necessary. But what I love about these cases, and there's a lot of them, is that this has such great potential. Generally, UFO researchers are limited to studying not UFOs directly, but UFO reports, which is a wholly different thing because you can interview someone about what they saw, but you're not seeing it yourself. Whereas a close encounter of the fifth kind allows a person to directly interact with, quote, the phenomenon with UFOs or ETs. So you can do live field work and actually study UFOs themselves instead of the reports. And another thing that's really cool about them is it gives a person who perhaps is just interested in the subject the opportunity to see one for themselves. The potentials of this are unbelievable because ultimately, if we could develop a relationship with ETs and open official contact, this could end the cover up overnight. So I think the potentials for it are outstanding. And there's quite a few cases. I became interested in this way back in the early 1990s when I really kicked up my research. I got involved in 1986 and spent a few years just studying and, and interviewing people. But one of the gentlemen I interviewed was named Arnie Weiler, and he worked for NBC as a set dresser. And he was doing a publicity stunt for NBC where they set up lights in the shape of a peacock's tail for, of course, the NBC logo. And this involved computerized lights that were in almost a full circle, sort of a three-fourths of a circle, all colored, quite large, and were designed to sort of flash on and off. And if you see this thing, it looks very much like a flying saucer. They had set it up on the lawn of the George Page Museum, the La Brea Tarpits in Santa Monica, 
in the 1980s, I believe it was. As soon as they turned it on, three UFOs came swooping down. And the guy I interviewed, Arnie Weiler, turned to the guy who was the special effects guy. His name was Rick Liebert. and said, look, UFOs. And Rick Liebert said, oh, you know, this keeps happening when I set up these lights. The object started off pretty quickly, but I spoke with Rick Liebert. I asked for his number and Rick agreed to an interview and I asked him to confirm that incident. He said, yes, that did happen. You said this happened before. And he says, oh yeah, it's happened a number of times. The one he really remembers was back in 1978 in San Diego when he was setting up a green argon laser on top of what was then the tallest building in San Diego, a bank building. And no sooner had they turned on this laser when this V-shaped object showed up. There was actually another one up above it, but it came quite low over the building and moved on. It was making a deep thrumming noise. But what's interesting about this is it's clear that this green argon laser is what drew this object in. It was a publicity stunt designed to attract attention, and it did, perhaps not the kind of attention they were expecting, but it's a good example of this kind of case. Stephen Greer, of course, became very well known for forming his group, CSETI, in which he formed chapters all across the United States and the world, really. Groups of people who go out and basically meditate and try to call down UFOs. And I became a member of that group when he came to LA and we had several sightings. We would go out and we'd all meditate and UFOs would show up. So this is an effective method. Now these days, I just need to put a warning here <laughs> to people because I'm not so sure UFOs are here right now. Having interviewed a lady by the name of Dolly Safran, who's a fully conscious contactee, I've mentioned her before. She's explained that our magnetic fields have become very unstable. So the ETs have had to basically evacuate. Right now, if you're doing CE5 work, this is something to be aware of. Because while you can communicate telepathically and still open a relationship and a dialogue, we have a lot of reverse engineered craft flying around now. I had another gentleman I interviewed for my book, Humanoids and High Strangeness. And he said, you need to warn people about doing CE5 work because you could call forth unsavory elements within our own government who are flying reverse engineered craft who don't have your own best interests in mind. So I'm just going to put that little warning out there. Uh, not that I don't think CE5 does work, but these days it's a little bit of a different story. But yeah, it's a, a really important aspect to ufology that I think definitely deserves attention. Agree. Each year, thousands of people gather at UFO conferences to hear the latest information from researchers and experiencers. And it appears that sometimes alien beings are showing up too. Could you, Preston, tell me about a conference at which aliens showed up? I decided to look into after kind of brushing up against it myself in 1994 when I attended the Triad Conference in San Diego on Coronado Island and it turned out a bunch of people on the night before the conference had encounters. And it wasn't just one or two, it was over a dozen people. I ended up writing a full length book about some of the witnesses who had encounters on the night before the conference, which is really unusual because if you know Coronado Island, it's very densely populated. It's got a huge police force. It's quasi-military, I and mean, this is where the Navy SEALs do their training. It's not a very likely place that you would think UFOs would show up, and yet they did. And there's a certain kind of appropriateness to UFOs showing up at a UFO conference, because this is where people are gathering who are very interested in this subject, many or most who've had experiences, and of course, researchers themselves. Didn't think too much of it. I thought it was a unique situation, but turned out not because later I was speaking at a conference in Irvine, California in 2015. I was speaking about USOs and there was a bunch of speakers there who were quite well known, Linda Zimmerman, Stanton Friedman and others. And turns out that there was a gentleman there by the name of Thomas Michael Knox, who 
now has gone on the lecture circuit talking about his own encounters and what happened to him at this conference. He was in his hotel room. The conference was being held at the Irvine Hotel. And in the middle of the night, Grays came into his room. They actually healed him. He was suffering from a torn Achilles tendon. And they came and they stitched it up and he, he was going to need surgery. Afterwards, he did not. He had a roommate. She saw this happen. He was largely unconscious for most of it, but did, of course, realize something had to have happened. And if that were it, the extent of it, I'd be like, okay, well, that's interesting. But a witness claimed to have been taken on board a craft on that night. She reported her experience to the National UFO Reporting Center. And she said she saw other speakers from the conference on board this craft. So that was interesting. It certainly piqued my interest because I was one of the speakers. I couldn't contact her. She was anonymous. But I did search for other reports and found out that there was a group of three or four people outside the hotel who said that they saw activity over the hotel that same night. So that's when I started looking into this because it wasn't long after that that Reverend John Polk published a book called Blue Beings at the conference, at the UFO conference. And I'm a little on the fence about this case. I talked to some people who were there, allegedly. Uh, some very tall, odd-looking folks showed up at this conference, the annual speakers conference in Portland, Maine. This was in 2015. And some folks swear up and down that what they saw were not human beings. They looked strange. They were dressed strangely. They behaved strangely. So there were some odd things going on there. But that's when I started looking into it. And I found quite a few cases of UFOs showing up at these conferences, and in a few cases, alien beings. To me, the most impressive one was contact in the desert in Joshua Tree in 2016, when that evening, a bunch of people were out sky watching, several hundred, I think it was like 300 people were out there when UFOs showed up. So this was very widely viewed. There was about a dozen craft which came, well, presumably craft, they looked like lights, but they, they were different colors. Some would be bright blue, others were green and red. And they would come, they'd stop, they'd turn at right angles. Sometimes they'd come in small groups and do what we call non-ballistic maneuvers, unconventional maneuvers, which rules out helicopters and satellites and weather balloons and so forth. But what's so interesting is not only were they widely viewed, but they were viewed through binoculars and night vision goggles and allegedly filmed. I was not able to find the film, but there were people with cameras filming them. Quite a few eyewitness testimonies written down, recorded. It's an amazing event. And again, I think strangely appropriate. I found quite a few cases, again, about a dozen. I suspect there's more of them. But a really interesting aspect, which really hasn't been talked about before, as far as I know. Amongst the contactee population, there appears to be a large number of twins, and there are a number of cases involving disappearing twins. What, Preston, is the reason ETs have a special interest in twins? I can only speculate. I looked into this because I started, as I interviewed people, they would mention, well, I'm a twin. I think, oh, well, that's interesting. There is a certain number of twins in our population, but there seem to be a higher incidence of twins among the contactee population than in general. I'm not entirely sure that's true. It's very hard to do a statistical analysis of this, but I certainly kept running into it enough that it started to raise my eyebrows. I had interviewed a gentleman who was a Navy medic, had a very benevolent encounter with praying mantis ETs, and it turned out so had his fraternal twin brother. In another case I investigated, a lady was pregnant with twins, and one of them disappeared in utero. So this is when I started to pay closer attention to this. I remember when Raymond Fowler published his book, The Allagash Abductions, two of the witnesses, there were four gentlemen who were taken on board a craft in Allagash, Maine. Two of them were identical twins, Jack and John 
wiener. And according to them, the ETs seem to single them out a little bit and seem to be spe especially interested in the fact that they were twins. And that's when I started looking deeper and finding a number of people who are twins, who are contactees, such as the Kinsella twins in England, Audrey and Debbie Hewins of Oxford, Maine. I found quite a few. So this, I think, is something that deserves more research because now that I've interviewed a bunch of contactees, I know to ask about this. And a number of them have said, oh, well, I am a twin, or at least I thought I was. My mother was diagnosed with having twins, but one disappeared in utero. And a number of these people have gone on board and later met their twin sibling. And scanning the literature on this, there's a number of cases where people are taken on board and they meet what they think is a clone. I don't know if it's a clone because cloning has proven not to be viable, certainly here on Earth. And I don't have any good evidence in terms of contact D cases that ETs use cloning. So I think what people are probably seeing is their twin. And it's so interesting to me because there are a number of cases where people are taken on board and see primary with human looking ETs. They will describe them as looking identical to the point that they could be twins. So this turns up a lot. We know ETs are very interested in genetics. The twin phenomena is a sort of interesting genetic thing in and of itself. So that could be part of what's going on here. But I just wanted to draw attention to this because there hasn't been any research into this. There's been no statistical studies and it's clear something is going on here. I mean, there's so many cases of these vanishing twins. that It's a well-verified medical phenomena, which has never been fully explained. Some doctors say, well, the twin has been absorbed by the mother, which may happen very early on in gestation. But some of these cases are upwards of three or four months where the twin disappears. So yeah, <laughs> we need more research into this. It's an interesting aspect, which I think has some real potential to provide some insights into what's going on here. Experiencers who have been taken on board UFOs often talk about seeing all kinds of intriguing artifacts in their spaceships. This includes books that contain advanced ET technology. Has any abductee read those books? And if they did, what kind of technology did they say it contained? I think this is my favorite chapter in the book. I did one on alien warnings, which, you know, ET warnings, which I think is probably the most important one. But this one fascinated me because I started getting cases of my own. And it first kind of captured my interest when I read about the Betty and Barney Hill case, which is so well known. I won't repeat it here other than to say that Betty asked for an artifact to prove her story. And they said, yes, look around, what do you want? And her eyes fell on a, this little blue book, thin, kind of this metallic looking blue cover. She's like, this is what I want. You won't be able to read that. She says, that's not the point. I just want it for proof. But she did open it up and look at it. And there were these symbols going down in rows and glowing white pages. And she was actually walking out of the craft at the doorway, about to leave with the book in her hand when they took it back. I said, no, you can't have it. This is my proof. You said I could have it. He said, well, that's the point. This could actually prove to be very harmful for you. And we've decided it's not a good idea. So they took it back. But it intrigued me because contactee Betty Andreessen had a nearly identical experience where she was given a blue book with a kind of shiny metallic cover, opened it up. There was white pages, which she said had spiritual wisdom inside of it. She wasn't able to retain a lot of it consciously. They tried to put her under hypnosis and get the information from her, which wasn't successful. But they gave her this book, and she took it home for two weeks. They said, you can only have this for a short time, and then we have to take it back. When I ran into a third case, I decided, you know what? This is interesting. Let's look into this. And I found a lot of cases. There's a gentleman by the name of Jeff Selver in Canada who was taken on board. And he was shown a book. 
and again described in very much the same way as sort of jeweled surface he opened it up and it downloaded all this information into him which he couldn't consciously remember for some time but later did and the whole book was all about how to develop your psychic abilities the importance of love positivity how to levitate very deep philosophical spiritual subjects so this is the theme that turns up again and again and again in these cases now you don't think of ets as having books like we do and they're not really books like ours they're clearly more advanced and i would point again to dolly saffron because i asked her about this and having researched these cases i suspected she may have run across this having such extensive experiences and she said that yes in fact very early on in her contacts they gave her a book which has actually expanded over the years she said it has an almost emerald like surface and glowing pages it can play music and interact it can show holographic images it's filled with aphorisms and all kinds of deep spiritual wisdom scientific as well and fits the pattern we see in case after case of this Whitley Strieber had this experience a thin blue book he actually had a couple of books one was more jeweled and another was thin and blue but one had all the history of spirituality and religion on earth and another was filled with spiritual wisdom so this is something and I put this out in the book and I got a huge response from people who've had this experience and I've never heard anyone talk about this before it really quite surprised me because I think people have a tendency to not talk about the higher strangeness aspects of their case especially if it's unique or hasn't been talked about before which is why it's so important to really be forthcoming truthful and transparent in your research and put all this information out because you can bet someone else is having this experience it was amazing to see so many cases of people describing these quote books in the same way I mean many researchers have these kinds of cases C. Lee Culver uh, Richard Boyland David Jacobs I mean you name it it's an important aspect to UFO contact one of the most common messages given to contactees by ETs or warnings of nuclear proliferation war aggression greed corruption pollution and the destruction of the environment regretfully many of those warnings were not heeded and mankind has suffered the consequences from your research Preston is mankind ready to wake up and heed the warning of our alien brothers and sisters regarding the catastrophes that have not yet happened but will if we don't do something to prevent them I sure hope so I'm an optimist by nature and it's clear to me that we are going down the wrong path even without ET warnings this is readily apparent but from the beginning since people were being taken on board in any numbers at all the modern age of UFOs this has been the warning it's been very consistent over and over again whether you're talking about human looking ETs or praying mantis or grays or little blue beings or tall whites or humanoids of any kind ETs this is the warning over and over and over again I think this speaks very loudly to the ET agenda their mission their goals there's a lot of fear surrounding this subject people are portraying ETs as negative and scary and even evil and it's simply not true first-hand cases do not support this because people are taken on board and they're often healed they're taken under the engine room and shown how the craft works and given information and guidance and of course there's these warnings and messages which are so clearly for our own benefit anyone who puts forth the idea that ETs are here to harm us or hurt us or take over has clearly not done their research I'm not saying ET contact can't be quite frightening for people because it often is and this might let, cause a person to label this as a negative experience which is certainly understandable but I don't think they're here to harm or hurt us or scare us or take over and these messages are a good example of why I think we need to listen to what they have to say because everything that they've warned us about is happening 
We are polluting. We are destructing our environment. The nuclear proliferation is out of control, and that seems to be a primary concern of theirs. This is when they started showing up in large numbers. It's the atomic age, right when we had the capacity to actually destroy each other and our planet, obliterate all life. To not heed these warnings would be absolutely foolhardy. And there is not a researcher out there who doesn't know this, that this is the message from ETs. It's very well known among researchers. Everyone who's ever looked into onboard cases has cases like these. It's, I think, one of the primary ET agendas is to basically warn us <laughs> And let us know we are on the pathway towards self-destruction. So it's quite unnerving and disconcerting, certainly concerning, that these warnings are not being heeded. Although I'm an optimist, I am not so sure that we are listening. We do still have a huge nuclear arsenal. There's always a war going somewhere on this planet. And some researchers have postulated or theorized that these are scare tactics to get us onto the right path. Others say, oh, no, they're just studying our emotions. And some say, well, none of these are going to come true anyway. But I have to tell you that the contactees themselves take this very seriously, feel that these are accurate predictions. And in a number of cases, some of these predictions have come true. The Navy medic I interviewed who had encounters with praying mantis, I mentioned him briefly, he had the same messages given. And some of the messages and warnings he was given did come true, involving landslides and hurricanes and tornadoes. They showed him all these images and basically said, since you started exploding nuclear weapons, it caused what we call a countdown clock. And all of these disasters will happen. You cannot stop them, but you can certainly mitigate them. This is really important that we start to listen because we are on the pathway to self-destruction. Any mainstream environmental scientist will tell you this. We've known it for a long, long time. You can just look at the oceans and the huge plastic dump that's in the ocean there that's the size of several states. There's plastic material in almost all organic matter on this planet, DDT as well. We have really botched things up, and it's time that we start listening to what the ETs are saying and clean up our act, or we will not survive. Thank God we do have ETs because they're collecting genetic material. Humanity will survive, if, if not here, elsewhere. But if we don't heed these warnings, we will definitely suffer the consequences. I agree with you, and like you, I am an optimist, and I hope that we do heed what they're telling us, but I will tell. Should viewers of Paranormal Yakker want to buy, not from here, Selected UFO Articles, Volume 5, or any of your other books, how, Preston, can they do that? You have a website. If you just type in my name on Google, Preston Dennett, it should take you there. The actual address is prestondennett.weebly.com. And if you go there, you can buy my books through the website, but you can also read excerpts of it so you can get a nice, good look at what's contained in the books. Of course, they're available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble and bookstores near you. I'm all over social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and so forth. I also have a YouTube channel where I'm putting out my research. So if you're not really into reading books, uh, you can certainly check out my YouTube channel. Many of my books are on Audible as well, I'm trying to get more of them. Some of my publishers are not cooperating, but I am trying. So definitely check that out. And I also do my own podcast with Dolly Saffron called The Light Gate, which airs each evening from 8 to 10 Eastern. We do Q&As, so you can also interact that way and learn about my research there. This is an important subject, Stan. I'm so happy to come on your show and yak about this because it is important. It's fascinating and interesting, but it's really profoundly important that people know we are not alone. I think it would change everybody's life and worldview and life on this planet. We could just accept the fact that we are being visited. Preston Dennett, I thank you for being my guest on Paranormal Yakker. As always, 
It's been a great experience yakking with you. Always a pleasure, Stan. Thank you. Hi, everyone. This is Stan Ballard, a paranormal yakker. I hope you enjoyed the interview you just watched. So that you don't miss any upcoming shows, be sure to subscribe to my free YouTube channel. To do that, just press the subscribe button on your screen.